In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In November of 1859, Charles Darwin's work on the origin of species was published. This book, drawing heavily on the observations and conclusions he made during his famous scientific expedition to the Galapagos Islands, gave birth to the secular and almost assumedly agreed upon ideas on how we human beings became what we are today. It also inspired the familiar phrase, survival of the fittest. This idea, drawn from Darwin's theories and coined by a man named Herbert Spencer, summarizes the argument that any biological organism that leaves the most copies of itself before expiring is what will contribute the most to future generations, as life, apparently without direction, design, or divine oversight, mysteriously goes on. Survival of the fittest. It is a cold and callous look at life. It leaves little room for moral standards and guidelines. It sees failure as something that simply happens, and ultimate failure, that is death, as something that cannot be corrected or reversed. Survival of the fittest does not allow much for mercy or for intercession or intervention from outside parties that might see a problem forming before that problem leads to its final result. Well, Jesus tells a parable about such things in our gospel reading for this morning. He says, A man had a fig tree planted in a vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? This man planted a fig tree, and he wanted figs. That makes perfect sense. But let's look at this a little more closely. He is depending entirely on the order and design of how this world works, perhaps completely ignoring the fact that he has no real authority over how trees grow and produce fruit, and he's definitely putting no work into it of his own to help with that. And now he comes in brazenly and expects the tree to give forth figs. But it doesn't. He waits and waits and waits. This past Wednesday evening, we explore Jesus' willingness to submit to the Father's will and to undergo His full wrath against human sin. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that if there was another way to bring about our forgiveness other than the brutal death and damnation that would come with the cross, He asked that the Father would point Him toward that path. Even still, Jesus prayed not for His own will, but for the will of the Father to be done. Jesus was willing to go forward with everything that waited for Him in the events surrounding His betrayal, arrest, trials, the violence He suffered, the separation from the Father's love that He underwent, and the darkness of death that He traversed. This work plays a vital part in our understanding of the parable that Jesus now tells us this morning. This work points us to the promise found in this parable and the promise that has been made with each of us apart from our own worthiness or work. The man in the parable who arranged for this seemingly useless fig tree to be planted in his vineyard has checked on it numerous times and has reached his wit's end. It isn't making figs. It isn't doing anything other than taking up space. Whatever the case, he sees no reason for this scenario to continue. He follows that popular notion that the fittest should survive. As we can see, this tree is weak. In fact, this tree is useless. And so the man sees what needs to happen. It needs to be cut down and removed. It is preventing the vineyard from yielding its full potential, or at least whatever he might think is its full potential. He thinks that the vineyard should be doing so much more than it currently is doing. So he goes to one of his employees. He reaches out to the vine dresser and gives the order that this tree be cut down. Again, what he's doing makes sense. If something that you had established, 
something you had purchased, something you were given charge over, isn't doing what you think it should be doing, well, why not do away with it? Why not subject it to drastic or catastrophic change? That's the view that we see this man as he deals with his vineyard. Of course, we must also note that he has been incredibly patient. He has waited for three full years. He has watched, and yet he has gotten nothing other than failure. So finally, he's done with it. But what about the one that he's hired to care for and keep up this tree and everything else in the vineyard? This man, the vine dresser, as Jesus calls him, has something to say, and he voices it. Sir, he says, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This vine dresser has, expresses the care and concern that we should all hope to receive in this life. He clearly puts value in the tree and in its potential. He values the tree more than the lost earnings or the fruit that the vineyard owner expects it to produce. And he is also willing to put in the amount of work required for what he sees to be something worthwhile and for it to continue on. He is not yet ready to walk away from this tree. He isn't willing to cut it down and cast it aside. He sees something worth saving. He sees something worth working for. And so he pleads for the otherwise voiceless side of the argument. Of course, that tree cannot speak. It can't ask for more time. It can't ask for another year. The tree has no idea what is being discussed or what the ramifications are of this debate. The tree can't express its desires, but can only receive the care that is given by this vine dresser as he serves the owner of the vineyard. But thankfully, the tree has someone who steps in and who stops the destruction that has been ordered. The tree has someone who intercedes and begs for mercy. And so do you. You have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ is the propitiation for your sins. He has made the payment that your sins owe. He has stepped in as your substitute and taken your place. He intercedes for you, and He stops the wrath of the Father from being poured out on you, even though that is precisely what you deserve. Your sin separates you from the perfect and eternal Father. But as this began, even all the way back at the start of time with our parents Adam and Eve, He set up a plan that would involve work being done on your behalf to free you from what your sin earns you. He told them, Adam and Eve, that one would come from their own biological line who would pick up those who are too weak to stand before his demands of holiness and sinlessness. He told them that one would come and would take the curse of sin upon himself, who would endure what waited for him on the outskirts of the city that he called out last week as one that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. This is the work of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. This is the work that He willingly subjected Himself to as He followed the will of the Father. This is the work that was performed outside of you and on your behalf. This is something that was done without your asking. This was done for you even though you cannot produce anything valuable or fruitful on your own. This was done for you even though all you can do for yourself is hurt those close to you and drive them away from you. This was done for you even though you think you are strong enough to survive on your own and yet cannot do anything to keep yourself drawing breath or to keep your own heart beating. Each one of us is entirely dependent on God's grace as we live in this world. You and I are entirely dependent on His mercy as we stand before Him. We have no business taking up space in this world which He created, which our first parents ruined, and which we ourselves daily contribute to its destruction. But Jesus steps in, and He begs your case for you. He does the work that you need to go on. He starts and finishes that which is required for you to be able to love God 
and love your fellow human beings. And he does this for all of us. This is what we see at the cross. This is what we see as we confess our sin and look back to the promise made to us in holy baptism. This is, he, is what He connects us to yet again this morning in Holy Communion as we are joined with our Savior in His true body and blood and joined with our fellow believers here and throughout time. He has called you by name. He has made you His own. He has stopped you from being ruled too weak to keep going. His strength covers all of your weaknesses, and He took your weakness upon Himself so that you would be able to stand. None of us can do it on our own power. We cannot do it on our own strength. Instead, He props us up, and He points to the work that was started and completed for us as He freely gives us His strength and absorbs our weakness. This is God's mercy. This is God's grace. This is God's undying love, given to us by His willingness to die for us in our place. Survival of the fittest? Well, the tree in Jesus' parable is by no means the fittest. And not a single one of us could rightly claim that description either. But by God's grace, His undeserved gift, by the work of His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent to free you what, from what you deserve, we know that even though we are weak, we survive through the faith planted in our hearts and the perfect sacrifice that covers all of our sins. Amen. Service continues now as we join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 158. Please rise. We confess, I believe in one God, the Father of